Western Railway has always been held in very high regard by railway enthusiasts. This program seeks to examine the myth perpetrated by the GWR's publicity department that the Great Western Way was best. Even the railway's most famous locomotive seemed to symbolize it, the king of locomotives. And here's the pioneer, King George V, still leading the way in 1988. The Great Western's London terminus added to the myth. Paddington Station was set in the west end of London, not in the city or south of the river like all the other railways. And Brunel's great edifice even boasted a cathedral-like roof under which the citizens of the Thames Valley and the west of England came and went about their business. The Great Western's locomotives also fussed about under the two arches and all had a family look about them one of the strongest house stars of any great corporation before the war. They were unlike any other railway's engines, the product of a long line of continuous development from the turn of the century to the formation of British Railways in 1948. It's the period since the formation of British Railways that forms the basis of this program, showing how the Great Western flag still flies today. The railway preservation movement sees to that. The steam locomotive has always aroused strong passions in boys and men. And it's the young lads who stood at the end of the platforms and took the engine's numbers who went on to preserve their memories by buying and restoring locomotives to full working order. They've created one of today's major leisure industries, keeping the power of steam alive for future generations. Taking the numbers was a hobby that many could not understand. But the loco spotters of the 50s and 60s were a serious bunch, for whom every spare moment was spent on platform ends or in the very home of the steam engine, the locomotive shed. Their name spelt magic for the enthusiasts and still evoked passion. Old Oak Common, Lera, Bristol Bath Road, Cardiff Canton, all meant one thing, Great Western steam engines and plenty of them. Here, the engines were serviced, supplied with water, coal, oil and sand. They were cleaned and stabled under cover, although by the early 1960s, cleaning had gone out of the window as British railways prepared to abandon steam and modernise. The locomotives may have been dirty, but the dirtiest word was diesel. The engines which were to replace those living machines which breathed fire. Steam engines are very labour intensive and being the product of Victorian engineering were reliant on the availability of cheap and plentiful labour. As that evaporated, so less labour intensive locomotives had to replace them and it became the dream of the 1960s enthusiast to cop as many steam engines as possible before they all went. Clubs and societies proliferated, perhaps the greatest being the Ian Allen Loco Spotters Club of the 1950s and 60s whose Bible listed every locomotive by class and number, the Ian Allen ABC. 5901 Hazel Hall is duly underlined and details are checked. The book listed all the locomotives of British Railways and gave full constructional details of each class. The very first locomotive listed was the X Vale of Rydal narrow gauge number 7 O England Dower, which hasn't been seen yet. So we'll start our survey at the beginning and the end, as number seven survived in BR ownership until 1988. The Great Western had inherited a number of steam engines from smaller companies absorbed in 1922, and these were given numbers at the beginning of the series, as the Great Western had a unique numbering system of its own, using four numerals. The three Vale of Rydal engines were narrow gauge and put at the beginning. From 1968, when BR replaced its final standard gauge or full-size steam engines, the little Welsh tank engines were BR's only steam engines. Sale to the private sector came in 1988. This was the official farewell, the real end of BR steam.
standard gauge Great Western engines bore four numerals, the second of which was the most significant. The 100 series consisted of a class of 262 tank engines, all in the 3100, 41, 51, 61 and 8100 ranges. All were variations on a theme and known as large prairies. The main variants were in wheel size, 8100s, and boiler pressure, 6100s. They were very versatile machines and could be seen on a great variety of workings throughout the Great Western system, from suburban passenger to mixed traffic and freight duties. A number of them have been preserved, the best known being this engine 6106, seen just before British Railways withdrew it from service. And then more recently, in its preserved form, working on loan to the Neen Valley Railway at Peterborough. Note its livery with the simple initials GWR, the last livery of the Great Western Railway. based at Ditcote, home of the Great Western Society. It spent many summers on loan to preserved railways and is seen here on the GWR once again, the Gloucester and Warwickshire Railway, the former GWR main line, which runs from Toddington near Cheltenham in the Cotswolds. our first tender engines, the 060-2251 class designed by Charles Collett in the 1930s. One out of 120 built survives and is on the West Somerset Railway. These engines could work over most of the railway system and were designated mixed traffic. This indicates they were suitable for both freight and passenger duties, as seen here. Both 2200 and 3200 series were assigned to these engines. Collett 060s were built to replace earlier designs of 060s, which were known as Dean Goods after their designer William Dean. These Victorian machines were mechanically similar to the Collett engines, but had a very different boiler outline. This was the style of Great Western engines up until the beginning of the century, when George Jackson Churchwood began a revolution in locomotive design, which led to the classic Great Western locomotive outline with a brass safety valve cover and copper cap chimney. The Dean outline was in the Victorian tradition, with a tall chimney and a massive steam dome. Massive is the epithet for the next type of 200, the 42, 52 and 7200. Indeed, this locomotive, preserved on the Torbay and Dartmouth Railway in Devon, is named Goliath, a name added in preservation, as the GWR only named its passenger tender engines. 
Those engines were mainly to be seen at work in the Welsh coal fields, but were used all over the system for various tasks, such as here at Ledbury as banking or helper engines. The 300s were tender engines, also seen throughout the system. They were 260s, known as moguls. These locomotives bring into focus Churchwell's locomotive design philosophy. In the early 1900s, he drew up a building program of standard designs, which were to cover all traffic requirements. These were the modern designs, with bell pair fireboxes and tapered boilers, two or four outside cylinders, and standard wheel sets. Strangely enough, the moguls didn't feature in the standard lineup as originally devised by Churchwood. But when in 1911 they were added, very few new drawings were needed, as they were an amalgam of the other standard designs a vindication of Churchwood's policy. The 1400 tank engines were direct replacements for earlier 042 tanks used for local passenger duties. The special coaches or auto coaches enabled the locomotives to be controlled from the wrong end via a system of push rods. This cut out wasteful time at terminals where conventional locomotives had to run round to be at the head of the train. A number of these little engines have been preserved, including 1466 seen at Didcot, where the Great Western Branch Line atmosphere has been recreated to perfection. Also seen at Didcot is an example of the earliest of Churchward's work, the famous City of Truro, the first locomotive in the world to have been recorded in excess of 100 miles an hour. The wheels are enclosed and the locomotive has two pairs of frames, inside and outside, an interim design phase between Churchward and his predecessor, Dean. Most of double frame locomotives disappeared in the early 1930s, but a nominally new class was created from two older designs to form the 3200 class, or Duke Dogs. This engine, Earl of Barclay and City of Truro, are the only survivors of these types and were to be seen together once again in 1989. unprotected nature of the footplate crew's accommodation is well seen. Even the last GWR tender engines didn't have as much protection as their contemporaries on other railways. The city of Truro is naturally owned by the National Railway Museum York and is permitted to run on British Rail's main lines as seen here. Today it's restricted to 60 miles an hour. The engine hasn't had very many outings on the main line as in deference to its age and importance it's limited to shortish trains which are not as economic to run as longer trains. 
400 series also incorporates a group of 060 tank engines known as pannier tanks because of the way the water tanks are slung over the boiler. Although seen here on a freight train on the Dart Valley Railway, these were passenger engines. Three survive today, and the West Somerset example is seen more conventionally on a passenger train. The final development of the pannier tank genre also occupies the 400s, the 34, 84 and 9400 tanks, built from 1947 onwards. Number 3409 was the very last steam engine built to a pre-nationalisation design, going into service in October 1956. In 1959 the first was scrapped, such was the pace of change. Two survived number 9466, illustrating the Great Western's association with the London Underground, who bought a number of ex-Great Western panniers out of BR service and used them until 1972. These 9400s were the nearest to a churchward pattern of pannier tank with a cone boiler and no dome. A long line of tank engines in West Wales introduces the next class, the 500 series of small prairies. These standard churchward locomotives were smaller versions of the 4100 series of prairies, the name given to a locomotive with a single axle at front and rear and three driving axles, a 262. These small prairies fell into three categories. The earliest had four feet one and a half inch driving wheels and were a little restricted in their use. The main production batches had six inch larger drivers and were divided into two types, the early ones having flat tops to their side tanks and the later 4575 series having sloping tanks which held more water for an increased working range. They were very useful machines, able to work over most lines and were at home on all types of work. This is one of the earlier batch, many of which have been preserved seen at work on the West Somerset Railway and may be compared to the later style of 5272, another Didcot locomotive seen on loan to the Clangothlan Railway. Note the higher side tanks. Another of the earlier series illustrates freight working. The number plate on the smoke box door indicates that this is in British Railways livery. These were added by BR, the GWR showing its numbers by painting them on the front buffer beam. <laughs> 
another good strain is seen behind a predominantly passenger type, the 1600 pannier tank, also in BR livery. These were the smallest of the pannier tank classes, all built under British Railways auspices. This is the only survivor. Twenty-six, thirty-six, and forty-six hundreds didn't survive long after the war, but fifty-six and sixty-six hundred tanks did. These were 062 tanks, especially built for use in Wales. They did, however, stray to other parts of the system, especially the Birmingham area, where they performed both freight and passenger duties. With a carrying axle only at the rear, they perhaps ran more effectively in reverse. Their true home was South Wales, where they replaced a myriad of designs of 062 tanks inherited by the GWR in 1922 from the Welsh Valleys Railways. There were as many different railways and locomotive types as there were valleys, and the GWR's strict standardisation policy only went some way to eliminating the characteristics of the coalfield railways. As the 5600s didn't look like any other type of Great Western engine, with their excessive front overhang, they actually preserved the different feel of South Wales. Quite a few are preserved, and 6619 is seen rather far from home, but still in a steep valley on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. The other extreme, Great Western liveried 5619, is seen on the Isle of Purbex Railway with green southern region style coaches. Also on the Isle of Purbeck is a 5700 pannier tank, an example of the most numerous class of Great Western engine. This locomotive is also the most travelled in preservation, being owned by Birmingham's Tysley Museum, who've loaned it out to various railways, including the GWR. which 863 were built, more than any other type of British locomotive, must really be the characteristic Great Western engines. With the similar looking 6400 and 1600 types, they constituted nearly 30% of GWR stock. Panniers covered all duties. Here, a typical freight is headed by Tyser's second engine, 7760. 
one pannier achieved fame after its service days. 5775 was used in the Railway Children film in a fictional sand-coloured livery reproduced in 1990 to celebrate 20 years since the film was made. There was only one major variant in the outline of the panniers, the shape of the cab. The later engines, two of which are seen here in 1965, had a more rounded cab than the preserved examples we've seen before. This is seen to better effect on 9789, seen shunting at Oxford near the end of steam. These engines were used for all types of duties, although shunting and short-haul freights were their main areas of work. A very small subclass of 12 had a further variation, with condensing apparatus and cut-back tanks for use through underground tunnels in London. Their work took them all over the GWR system, this pair being seen in South Wales with a freight train over the former Brecon and Merthyr Railway. Heavy freight was handled by the 2800s. These powerful machines, 167 of which were built, were a product of Churchward's standardization. They bore the standard number one boiler, which also appeared on passenger and mixed traffic locomotives of classes 2900, 4900, 4000 and 6800. With an eight coupled wheelbase, they were slow but powerful and were used entirely for freight traffic. Preserved examples are normally used on passenger trains, but frequently show how it used to be on demonstration freights. One of the highlights of the preservation era was the running of a freight train behind 2857 on the South Wales main line in 1985, an event which has sadly never been repeated. With the same standard number one boiler, the 6800s were described as mixed traffic engines. Churchward proposed these as a standard design in the early 1900s, but they weren't built until 1936 by his successor Collett. None of the 80 engines survived, but they were the subject of a long-standing rumour that they'd not been scrapped by British Rail but retained as a strategic reserve, hidden in a quarry or tunnel in case the world ran out of oil. They embodied all Churchward's principles, with two large outside cylinders, a tapered boiler, standard fittings and tenders, and in another Great Western standard tradition were named after buildings, in this case, Grangers. There seems to have been little call for these engines, as the larger wheel 4900 or Hall class could do everything they could. But they were a 1930s recessionary reaction, as they were rebuilds of the 4300 moguls with the original five foot eight inch wheels. <laughs> 
also rebuilds of the Mughals were the early Manners, or 7800 class. These were much smaller than the Grangers, and a disproportionate number of the 30 built have been preserved. This is Hinton Manor in mid Wales in 1991. Twenty manors were built before the war and ten in 1950. A hundred were planned to replace the moguls. They were intended to be powerful but light for use on weight restricted routes such as the Cambrian main line. This is Odney Manor working in Lancashire, probably the furthest north a manor has ever been. Both the previous engines wore BR livery, but 7827 Lydon Manor wears the GWR's fully lined livery of the 1920s on the Torbay line. She's one of the 1950 built engines. Once again, the versatility of Great Western engines is seen on the Llandothrin Railway with Foxcote Manor on a freight. This engine sports a fully lined BR livery, as applied to many of the class in the late 1950s. Numerically, the largest class of 460s was the 4900 or Hall class. 330 were built, a development of Churchward's Saint class of express passenger 460s, but with smaller wheels. In fact, the first Hall was a converted Saint, 4900 Saint Martin. These engines were used on all major types of traffic, proving relatively quick and very powerful, the classic mixed traffic type. This hall is seen in the last days of BR steam at Oxford, where they were involved with inter-regional trains from the southern region. They were also common in freight traffic, as seen on the Bristol main line. This train is an engineer's ballast train, and the engine is in very poor external condition, as was common in the last days of steam. The western region of British Railways eliminated steam on all the former Great Western lines from the 1st of January 1966, although a few engines had to soldier on after that date on other lines. In the last days, nameplates and number plates were removed, making it difficult to identify individual engines. Some people thought this was a good thing, as the Western's public relations staff had had some difficulty finding 329 names of halls. There were two variants of halls, original halls and modified halls. Although of nominally the same class, the 6959 modified halls were more different to their classmates than were they to other Churchward locomotives. The modifieds had a different frame pattern and a completely different front bogey. These two are on the southern region with inter-regional through trains at Battledown Flyover and Eastleigh. Note also the flat-sided tender introduced by the post-war chief mechanical engineer Hawksworth. In the last days of steam, the halls of both types were popular for rail tours as they survived to the very end of steam. This is the class described in the Ian Allen ABC at the start of this program. And it had one number missing, 4911. This engine was a war casualty, destroyed in an air raid in 1941, nine years before the last one was built. Many are preserved, 6996 Burton Agnes Hall the later series of Hawksworth engines being seen here on the Welsh marches. <laughs> 
Wordsworth's only fully original design was his 1000 class, named after counties. They were mixed traffic engines, but their outline, whilst at first looking similar to other machines, was subtly updated. The tenders were flush-sided, the smashes over the driving wheels were continuous, the chimney was lower, the frames continued in front of the smoke box, the smoke box saddle was fabricated rather than cast, and they had straight nameplates. They were a further update of the halls with a new boiler, the standard number 15. None survived into preservation, and this is the very last run with one of them seen at Swindon, the Great Western's famous locomotive workshops. Perhaps the archetypal Great Western Express engine was the castle. Here is the appropriately named Windsor Castle on the Royal Train in 1962, seen passing through West Bromwich. Churchward designed the progenitors of the castles, the stars, as part of his standardization scheme and Collett increased the size of the boiler to produce the castles in 1923. This engine, number 4079 Pendennis Castle, is preserved in Australia in honour of the fact that in 1925 it was run in trials against Sir Nigel Gresley's famous A3 or Flying Scotsman class and proved itself to be a superior engine. The A3s were altered as a result of the trials, this leading on to the design of the A4s, one of which Mallard became the fastest steam engine ever. The Great Western, however, was satisfied with the castle design and continued to build examples of the class right into the British Railways era in 1950. These views illustrate the classic Great Western Express in BR days, a castle heading up to 11 coaches. 171 locomotives were built, including 16 rebuilt from Churchward engines, 15 from Stars, and one from the solitary Great Western Pacific, the Great Bear. One of these was withdrawn from service before the final ten were delivered. The standard castle outline was unchanged over the years, although the chimneys were reduced in height over a period. Originally, the early locomotives ran with very low tenders, which gave them an unbalanced look. The boiler was unique to the class, being larger than the standard number one type, and this set them apart from the other passenger and mixed traffic classes with the smaller boiler. They could be seen on most mainline routes of the Great Western on the top expresses and were coded red in the route restriction scheme. The scheme ranged through yellow and blue routes on which progressively heavier and more powerful locomotives could run up to the red routes, which were the main lines on which castles, halls, saints and grangers could run. Two variations of outline can be seen here. Flat-sided tenders were fitted to the post-war castles and were transferred amongst the class during BR days. Also in BR days, the final developments to the engines were made, resulting in some engines being fitted with double exhaust chimneys. Farley Castle is seen here in this condition, the much larger chimney giving a distinct change to the classic outline. This was applied only in the last days of BR from the mid-1950s onwards. This is the last run of the famous Pendennis Castle, climbing through the outer London suburbs on the old Great Western Main Line to Birmingham. In the 1960s, number 7029 Clum Castle was purchased for active preservation. She was one of the double chimney variety and undertook rail tours all over the country, including a visit to Carlisle via the Settle and Carlisle Line, the furthest north a castle has ever been. For many of these runs, she ran in her standard British Railways livery, the only one she'd ever worn, as she was one of the final batch of ten engines delivered in 1950. She looked quite superb at the head of a full rake of maroon coaches. But later, she was repainted into a quasi-Great Western livery that never looked quite right on a double-chimneyed locomotive. However, that chimney still sported a copper cap, even though it was a British Railways design. The Western region had retained the Great Western identity right through the supposedly conformist BR days. Clun Castle continued to work after the end of steam, until 1988, when she was withdrawn for overhaul. This is her last rail tour before overhaul. Once again, she sports a BR livery. Note the twin exhausts in the chimney.
For many people throughout the first half of this century, the Great Western spelt holidays. Hundreds of thousands of holidaymakers made their way to the West Country alongside the seawall at Dawlish and Tynmouth. This was their first view of the seaside, and many a tear was shed in 1985 when the Western region celebrated 150 years of the Great Western Railway by running trains headed by no less than two castles. Both had celebrated careers as restored engines in the 1970s and 1980s. Chris Lewin Castle is housed at Didcot and Clun at Tysley. Clun Castle had a shed made in the form of 5080 Defiant, part of a batch of castles named after Second World War aircraft. Here she is travelling from Tysley to Didcot on the 1988 rail tour. The fifth working preserved castle appeared in 1991. 5029 Nunny Castle is also a product of Didcot Shed and effectively replaced Drisluin when it was withdrawn for overhaul. Here she climbs the bank from Stroud on the route from Gloucester to Swindon on a prestige train run for British Rail's intercity sector. She bears the full Great Western livery. 
Didcot is also home to 6024 King Edward I. Here she heads north from Didcot on a cold morning. The kings were the ultimate expression of great western power, a 30-strong class of an improved castle design, introduced into service in 1927. This engine was built in 1930. Much of the legend of great western power and charisma was built around the kings, and that aura remains today. The massive boiler, larger than on any other Great Western class, gives these engines a very powerful look at the front. Even the kings had to die. However, this hulk at Swindon in 1964 was King George V, which is immortal. She was retained by BR for preservation and became the first steam engine to work on a BR main line after steam had been eliminated from working stock. She started the revolution, which today sees steam at work at least every week in the summer and sometimes every day, the steam movement of today. Did the Great Western have a special aura? The answer has to be yes. Finally, the fastest and the most famous. City of Truro and King George V teamed up for one memorable rail tour, seen here just south of Shrewsbury. 